All right, I am excited to call to order the uh, town council meeting, the first one we've had in person for uh, just about a year. So welcome back. Uh, it's exciting to see every, everybody here, all the faces, all the individuals. So um, welcome, let's uh, stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll. Mayor Breikers? Here. Vice Mayor Hartman? Here. Councilmember Albritton? Present. Councilmember Jablonski? Here. And Councilmember Kaczynski? Present. We have a quorum here. <clears throat> Thank you. So our first order of business is a very special one. Um, it's a proclamation to Rick Cormier for really um, just going above and beyond. Um, we've been announcing the, uh, the mulch and all that, but it's more than just that, it's spreading the whole nine yards. So um, if we'd like to read that proclamation into the record. Certainly, Mayor. So this is a proclamation recognizing Rick Cormier and Lemon Lime Landscaping for their volunteer recognition. Whereas the scope of government services is vast and it's, it is challenging to meet the diverse needs of a community. And whereas volunteerism provides an enhancement to the levels of service provided by government to its community and is therefore vital to help cultivate a vibrant community. And whereas volunteers who give of themselves without any, without any expectation other than the satisfaction of knowing they're contributing to the value of their community should be celebrated and recognized for their efforts. And whereas Rick Cormier, owner of Lemon Lime, Lemon Lime Landscaping in Southwest Ranches, is a volunteer deserving of such recognition for his selfless contribution of his business resources to the town, including collecting and delivering mulch, donating his machine and laborers time to distribute mulch for residents benefit at Southwest Meadows Sanctuary, Calusa Corners, Country Estates Fishing Hole and S Sunshine Ranches Equestrian Parks, saving the town thousands of dollars. And whereas Rick Cormier has demonstrated that he gives of himself selflessly to the town and its residents and is a beacon of hope for the future of our community and for this should be recognized. Now for the, now therefore the mayor and town council do hereby extend our deepest thanks to Rick Cormier on his contributions to the town and designate June 10th, 2021 as Rick Cormier Day. Proclaim this 10th day of June 2021 by the mayor, Steve Breikers. December, you're gonna get a picture? Yeah. Right. Do I go up there? Yeah, they're gonna the council members will come down and then uh, <laughs> See, you just never know. You never know. You never know.
Jessica's job is for all that info. She went to uh, Michigan, so I need him to come out and take some trees down, though. Yeah, some Mount Rupert. Well, thank you again, Rick. Really appreciate it. All right, so the next item on our agenda, we are very pleased to have Representative Bartleman here with us this evening. Um, you may have, if you've been watching Facebook or seeing the messages, we have some great news to tell based on the hard work that she's done for us. So Robin, thank you so much for coming this evening and looking forward to your, your full report. Thank you. I am so happy to be in this wonderful town. I first, I, I got the link for Zoom, but I was like, no, I'm coming because great. I don't, it's awesome. great that we're reopening and we're doing all of this. But I do want to just say thank you all for what you've done for the residents. And uh, even though we were all locked up, you still had the holiday lighting and the flamingos to raise money for the scholarship and the food drive at the Hindu temple. There's a lot going on here. And so thank you for uh, helping this community and everything you do. And thanks for your participation thank in all those events. Thank you. I love them all. <laughs> So I have, let me start with the good news. Well, most of the news for me is good this year. <laughs> um, we, the, the governor did sign the town of Southwest Ranch's country estates drainage and water to quality improvement project. And the project goal was to alleviate flood staging and routing while improving water, water quality by capturing runoff and transporting it via swales. Lower the community rating system score, which, which would provide significant reductions in flood insurance which is very important to all of your residents. Uh, it will improve the town's overall drainage resilience in the event of a major blockage or failure on either end of the system. And it will reduce longstanding stormwater staging experienced by residential properties adjacent to front, Frontier Trails Park and to the other two, and the, and the other to significantly increase water quality. So we worked really hard. The project consisted of constructing a drainage collective, collection system with underground piping and drainage inlets to provide a direct, direct connection to the existing trunk line along Southwest 54th Place that ultimately ties into the South Broward Drainage District Canal and floodgate that connects to the C11 Canal. So I'm very excited about this. So after um, Tropical Storm Etta, and I, I spoke about this with all of you, my goal was to deal with inland and coastal flooding. So all of my projects reflected that because after meeting with Kevin Hart and going out to the C11 Canal and meeting with Mr. Bergeron, we're all interconnected. So it's really important that we all work together. So in addition to your project, I also uh, was awarded a project in Pembroke Pines for a seepage, uh, the installation of an internal stormwater pump, which will deal with the seepage issue that exists out in West Pines. And we know we're all in connect, interconnected through the canal. So even though we're, the water is moving this way to the C11, when it goes back to the Everglades, if it seeps back in, that's a problem for all of us. The other appropriation I was awarded was $350,000 for two mobile stormwater pumps for the South Broward Drainage District, which we're really excited about. This is the first time they have ever received appropriation from the state, and that will help us so they can move water in, the, in an emergency, and they will be utilized throughout uh, the South Broward Drainage District area, which includes multiple cities. Uh, I just met with Kevin Hart this week, and we have some other projects we're going to work on, including uh, uh, fixing some pipes and so it's a long-term plan we're going to have and anything I can do to help you all because people were trapped in their homes animals I'm very excited about what you're doing for the animals but we need to be able to move the water so that was the picture that involves our local community uh, but when I got up there I said I need to do something a little bigger so I did an inland and coastal I wrote an inland and coastal flooding bill um, and it was a great bill to require the Office of Demographic Research to study and conduct long-term long planning for flooding, and that way we can um, apply to federal grants, and it creates a system of accountability, and the first meeting I had with my, the Speaker of the House, he said, oh, I really like this bill. This is a great bill. I'm going to add it to my flood package, and I was like, okay. So it was really exciting. So it wasn't like my bill that I got to present on the floor because it was uh, language added to a master flood package that was signed by the governor and funded. So what's really important to me is that it's going to, being part of that flood, flood package will change, you know, the history of the future history of Florida. 
because for the first time they're acknowledging we do have sea level rise. We do need to address it for our residents and our businesses. And instead of my one piece, it's a comprehensive plan to deal with it, which will help all Floridians. So I'm very excited about that. Um, we did pass the largest budget uh, in Florida's history, $101.5 billion. Uh, almost 40% of the budget is federal funds. I was excited that our first responders and teachers received $1,000. We had a $3 billion increase in education uh, for all your parents, and many of them emailed me, Bright Futures is safe for now. That seemed to be the, one of the hot topics of this legislative session. This is my daughter, Sarah Bartleman, and she goes to UF and has Bright Futures as well. And so um, this way she doesn't have to choose a certain major and she can still receive our bright futures because all of our students have worked really hard, high SATs, community service, high GPA. And then to say, well, you can only major in these categories, that it doesn't work. Uh, unfortunately though, they did remove the book stipend for bright futures. So parents who do uh, have bright future scholarships should be aware of that change. And as a former special education teacher, we did take uh, 1900 people off the agency with for people with disabilities wait lists. There's a 23,000 uh, individual wait lists because they're, it, it's just unfortunate. And, and, and we have a lot of residents in this community that have children and even adults and adult children and adult family me members living with special needs and the wait list, it's impossible. You're, you're on it forever. People usually put their children on it at an early age and it's very difficult to get off. So any movement is excellent. Um, I also wanted to just talk about uh, a couple of other bills. Um, I started uh, also with a big bang because I didn't want our schools to have to be graded or have high stakes testing. We didn't have a typical school year. You know that your city manager fought COVID and made it. And many of our teachers and students and uh, parents, they, they face the same circumstances. Many of our families were dealing with housing insecurity, food insecurity. <clears throat> uh, students were coming in and out of quarantine, which is a huge issue. So it just seemed kind of ridiculous to say, well, now we're going to hold you accountable for test scores when nothing has been typical about this school year. So when we held the press conference and I had the Florida PTA and the teachers and the parents and the school boards, I said, look, we don't have to, we don't have to pass this bill. This can be done with an emergency order. And luckily the governor, uh, uh, right before, I think it was April, he signed an emergency order, which included all the language that was in my bill and then some. So I was very excited to see that happen. So you don't always have to have a bill passed to make change. So I was very excited about that. And I'm waiting right now for the governor to pass Serena's law, which I uh, worked with uh, Representative Mullica, who's in Naples. Serena is a young girl who was um, sexually assaulted when she was young. She waited till much later to tell her parents. And at that time she decided not to pursue criminal charges and years later, she found out that the gentleman was working in some sort of capacity with children. Because no criminal charges were filed, when you do a level two security check, you're not gonna see anything because he hasn't been arrested and he hasn't been charged, but he did have a lifetime uh, restraining order, a lifetime injunction. So what they found was that the clerk of courts has, a, has an issue where if you go in and the uh, victim is a child, you can't access any of the file. So it's a loophole in the system and this law will correct that and it's we're waiting now for the governor to sign it. So we're very excited about that. I will continue to work on affordable housing and kid care, which I know are multi year bills. We know that affordable housing there's a huge affordable housing crisis here in Broward County and all of us are lucky to live in our homes but our children aren't going to be able to find homes when they grow up and more importantly, we need a we need a workforce. And right now at $420,000 for a medium price of a home, uh, you know, incoming police officers and teachers, they're not gonna be able to afford that. So we need to do something so we have a workforce. Now I wanna talk about your city manager and your attorney. They were amazing. They were, I called, I, some weeks I called them five, 10 times because I'm on the state affairs committee. So I get every bill that affects a municipality. As a matter of fact, I'm on the subcommittee and the main committee. So there were a lot of bills that uh, were proposed and passed to take away your local control. So anytime the bill came through the committee, I'm like, what does this do for Southwest Ranches? How is this gonna impact Southwest Ranches? 
As a matter of fact, I testified for Southwest Ranches and many of the committees, and I spoke about circumstances that were occurring here in Southwest Ranches and why that would be a problem for Southwest Ranches. So I'm going to end by just, instead of speaking about bills, I just want to give the commission a heads up about bills that impact your local control. Um, the first one you know about the relief from burdens on real property rights, that I did vote against this bill, uh, but it did pass, and that impacts the Burt J. Harris Act. It changes it, and it weakens growth management and prefers private property rights over local growth management. Uh, impact fees, uh, I voted no on this as well. It passed, it caps impact fees at a dollar for dollar basis and adds new requirements to entities. Um, also, we have, this one is really important uh, because you're going to have to look at what laws you have in place. House Bill 403 will now allow home-based businesses, and it prevents municipalities from placing any restrictions and any requirements on home-based businesses that are not on typical businesses. It's a home rule preemption, and we know that I sat through a whole commission meeting learning about the vet office <laughs> and hearing from neighbors, so I was very concerned about this one. So I hope everyone, you go through your, your ordinances um, also, we have um, a preemption on local uh, regulation of energy infrastructure that passed. And this one we, I worked very hard on, and I actually, we were able to change it, and then it switched back. It's House Bill 883, County and Municipal Code Enforcement. So it prohibits anonymous complaints. So when I first heard the bill, I was on the phone with, I even called some of the commissioners, I think, I think with Bob and Steve and David and everyone. And uh, the representative who sponsored the bill amended it and allowed anonymous reporting. And we, so I voted no the first time, yes the second time. And then when the Senate got it, they changed it again. And at that point I voted no. But it, it's an issue because you want people to feel comfortable to report code violations. And it creates an uncomfortable situation when you're reporting a code violation on your neighbor and it creates problems. So uh, just pay attention to the language in that bill and how you're going to um, how you're going to move forward with it. It does leave a little more room now, and uh, preemption over restriction of utility services, and emergency management powers of political subdivisions. Uh, that's another big issue. Uh, but those are some of the bills that I wanted to make you aware of, since you're in charge of this community, and they're the bills that are going to impact this community. So you can, you know, figure out how you're going to implement them and uh, get things done here. But I have loved working for you all. I know Gianni's reached out to everybody. We're going to meet with you again about your about any uh, sort of. Um, we're going to go. Actually, I just spoke with. Uh, eight, um, City Manager Burns, and I know you have a strong capital improvement plan, so we're going to go through the projects that I'm going to bring forward next year, and it has just been a pleasure working with this town. It has been, everyone has been accessible to me. If I need any information, you all were there, and I want to make informed decisions that benefit your residents, so, and you're the voice for the residents, so thank you, and for all the residents watching, again, my cell phone number is 954-668. 3662. I'm Robin at myfloridahouse.gov. Um, if you need any assistance, uh, I deal, I'm still dealing, I still get a ton of calls regarding unemployment and people not getting their money and their claims. Uh, the new thing we're getting are businesses who had false uh, claims filed against their business. So if they're business owners in the community and they, they find out that there's this employee they never heard of who said they were, un, you know, they're unemployed and now it's counting against the business. Don't try to navigate that alone. Reach out to me, call me. We have a database. We have direct connections and we'll do everything we can to facilitate that process for you. Business licenses, uh, teacher certification seems to be a real issue. People, the teachers out there are having issues uh, getting their certifications approved. So whatever I can do to streamline the process for you, I will. Just reach out to me, and if it's a state agency, I can get you in touch with the right people to help facilitate that. So I'm here to work for you. So no question is too small. Just whatever you need help with, be sure to call me. I'm here. If you have ideas and suggestions for bills, I, I want to hear from you. Also, uh, email me or sign up to be on my newsletter, and I just can't thank you all enough. And I know it's almost summer. But uh, I'm so happy to be here in person and to have my mask off. I'm vaccinated. And this is great news for the town of Southwest Ranches. So to all the council members, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Mayor, if I may? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Representative Barlow, thank you very much. Even though your name was not on that uh, th with the flood, we know we know what you did, and we appreciate that very much. You, you hit a home run for our town with that, that water project. Thank you. Very much. Mayor, yeah. I, I normally would never speak on something like this, but I, I just feel it's important. Absolutely. I believe this was uh, Representative Barnum's first real session. Mm -hmm. And for 20 years, we've had lobbyists in Tallahassee. We've <laughs> actively had to be up there to advocate, advocate for ourselves and our funding request. This, I can honestly tell you, was the first year that we did virtually nothing no offense to the lobbyists, they did virtually nothing. <laughs> and we had an amazing representative who carried the entire water for the town for the first time ever. Right. So I commend you for your efforts for our entire community. Right. Yep. Mayor, if I may as well. Please. Uh, just to, to uh, piggyback on Keith's comment, I wanna thank Representative Bartleman for the communication that we enjoyed throughout the session. It was very comforting from our standpoint to know that we had that representation up there and that the communication was what it was. And so we look forward to continuing to work with you. We're here to be a resource for you as well. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, Robin, excellent job. And I mean, from day one, you were you were right on top of everything. So really appreciate it. Um, and we're already working on next year. So there's, there's no stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, please, please. <laughs> Thanks for coming by. All right, um, public comment. We can- uh, Sure, we can sure, Mayor. Uh, now, the, the, I spoke a little bit to Russell and, and with your permission um, to avoid a, for the next two meetings, we have both Zoom and in public. So what we'd like to do with the consent of you and the council is to go to the Zoom speakers first okay. so that people aren't jumping up and down and having to stand. Perfect. Close Zoom speakers and then go to the public. Makes sense. Is Good. that okay? Yes. Sir. All right. So Russell, if you could please call on the Zoom speakers. Speakers have three minutes each to speak on non-agenda items. Certainly. Okay. So the first speaker, Mayor, is uh, Marianne Allen. <clears throat> Ms. Allen, can you hear us? Okay, can you hear me now? There we go. Yes, we can. Thank you, thank you. Um, I thought Representative Robin was doing a great job, but there was one thing that just struck my heart. With the mention hey, of- Marianne, we, we heard you at first, but it's very muffled right now. Not okay, can you hear me? Much. There we I've, go, yes. I've, I've had trouble hearing you. The volume isn't very good on, on the Zoom, but I can hear you if I put it right up to my ear. So anyway, something that she said really got my heart racing. She talked about affordable housing and how we need it in this area. I want to remind all of you, because you weren't there, 20 years ago, we all met in Pembroke Pines, was 550 of us. And we spoke loud and clear that there was absolutely no way we would have affordable housing in this community. Number one, most of the people that live here got themselves away from affordable housing so that they could afford to live in peace and quiet without drug-ridden, crime-ridden affordable housing. It sounds nice, but the reality is any affordable housing brings crime, drugs, and gangs. This is a fact. This isn't fiction. And we have fought it then, and we will fight it now. So as our council members, I want you to be aware that the public in this town, the residents, we do not want affordable housing and the crime and gangs and drugs that it brings, okay? I just wanna make that clear because we spoke loud and clear. There's a lot of things that our town did, which was to switch um, um, water mitigation from Pembroke Pines. We took their water mitigation and they took affordable housing for us. That was 20 years ago. So there are things we can do to avoid this problem. Thank you so much for hearing me. And I liked everything else she said. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. The next speaker is uh, George Kalis. Mr. Kalis, can you hear us? I hear you. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Hey, George. Hi, Steve. How are you? Uh, six seven two one Hancock Road, or right next to the dump. You know what's coming, guys. Uh, my my neighbor. I, the only reason I'm on now is because I have to keep this thing alive. Nothing is happening. Five loads of truck, uh, five truck loads of uh, cuttings, mulch, call it what you want. Every day come in and consistently come in. Uh, he bought this property for half a million dollars, and I'm sure he didn't buy it to raise bananas or Jamaican spinach or whatever they call that stuff. And nothing goes out unless it goes out in the trunk of a car. Plus, with his tax exemption, he, he's paying less than $100 on, on a five acre plot. Uh, the rest of us are carrying the load for him. Uh, and, and I keep hearing that nothing can be done. You've heard all this before. Uh, it, it's a fire hazard. And, and I would really appreciate if the fire chief would come and, and condemn it as a fire hazard uh, because of, uh, and it's the hot months coming in. He's got mulch all over the place piled up and something about spontaneous combustion. Uh, the other dangerous thing is that the, uh, he has a curtain around the whole property, over a thousand foot of curtain that's attached to a two by four and the two by four is nailed to all the posts. Now, in a hurricane, what do you suppose this thing is gonna do with two by fours attached to a thousand foot of curtain flying all over the place? People are gonna get hurt. Uh, there'll be a lot of property damage for sure. And it's got to stop. If you don't think it's bad, uh, you put George Lorenzo and Danny Perdella on the uh, top board, and I know they've reported to you, and I'm sure, I'm sure what they said. Uh, and, and you've all heard it. And, and I guess the most disappointing thing for me is that other than Mayor Steve, nobody is commenting on this. Nobody even seems to care. Uh, the, the biggest perpetrator is Brightview. It's an outfit called Brightview. And on their trucks, the telephone number is 844-620-9797. Maybe somebody can give them a call that's on the council and see if they're paying to, to unload all this stuff. Uh, obviously that would make him commercial and, and, and you can stop him. Let me reiterate, I am not after his exemption. Uh, I don't mind if there's a nice looking nursery, go back on volunteer, go back all the way back on 100 and I believe it's 99th where George and, and uh, Danny are. These are all, nicely well-maintained properties. And I'm, I'm not the only one that's complaining. The whole neighborhood is complaining. You don't hear it anymore because there's nothing, uh, nothing, there's just no interest in it. So having said that, I would really appreciate to get some comments. And, and, and all the time that I've been complaining, which is just about every meeting, I, I wanna say this, if, if in any way, I have offended anyone. I apologize. I really do. Uh, that, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thanks, George. <clears throat> the next speaker is uh, Michelle McBride. Good evening, Mayor. Hey, Good Michelle. evening, Mayor and Mr. Councilman. Adam. Hi, um, I just had a quick comment about uh, the Zoom meetings being just for the next two meetings, only because I am still shoveling poop here in my barn. It's 89 degrees at 6.20 p.m. And I was just wondering why we couldn't continue it for a little while. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. That was the final uh, speaker from Zoom, Mayor. Sure, Mayor, we have uh, four public speakers in town council chambers tonight. Uh, we're starting with Chase Pepper, who speaks on behalf of Christ Covenant Church. I'd also like to uh, submit. Okay. 
Chase Pepper, 18901 Southwest 61st Manor. Dear Town Council of Southwest Ranchers, the purpose of this letter is to serve as a written objection to the proposed fire assessment for the upcoming fiscal year as pursuant to ordinance 2109, section 2.6, which states the Town Council shall receive any written objections of interested persons and may then make such amendments as it deems just and right. I'm ready today to inform you that this proposed fire assessment is not just nor right. As the town council is aware of the fire assessment burden that has been placed on Christ Covenant Church, as well as other religious institutions, is an increase of over 500% from the historic assessment due to the new methodology created by resolution 2020-45. On top of this unjust assessment fee is the timing in which it's being imposed. Along with almost every business in America, the church has been financially hindered for over a year due to the COVID-19 shutdowns. Additionally, church has contacted fire, rescue, EMS exactly zero times during this period. To quote the preamble of ordinance 20109, the town is desirous of ensuring that the cost of the fire services are borne on a fair and reasonable basis by the property owners receiving the benefit from said services. This assessment is clearly not fair, reasonable, just, nor right. As the book of Proverbs 28, verse 16 states, a ruler who lacks understanding is a cruel oppressor, but he who hates unjust gain will prolong his days. We ask on behalf of the Church of Jesus Christ, please do the right thing and do not unjustly burden his ministry with unjust gain, respectfully. Thank you. Next speaker, Jim Lasky, <clears throat> followed by Newell Hollingsworth, and the final speaker is Debbie Green. That was very interesting what uh, Chase just said. Um, I happened to uh, take a look at uh, a performance audit that was done in Leon County today, and they talk about the culvert and how it affected uh, their performance, and they have numbers on it. And they said that their fire trucks and their emergency uh, personnel were spending a lot of time taking people to the hospital or probably answering calls about not being able to breathe. What do you do when you can't breathe and you're out there? I mean, have we documented cases like that? If so, why shouldn't we be reimbursed through FEMA? And why couldn't that gap be made up with a lot of calls or whether they're phone conversations or where you actually go out and give somebody oxygen for an hour or two or take them to the hospital or the doctor or or get a hold of your uh, the uh, the doctor that's supposed to be the advisor to the fire department. I don't know. Is there any documentation on that? That could add up to a lot of money. Not to mention uh, the fact that the church was probably doing a lot of that kind of stuff too. If nothing else, they were feeding people and taking baskets of food to people or uh, amassing them. They're not skilled in that. So the amount of time it took for them to individually learn the procedures, learn the ropes, know who to talk to, that adds into the cost, even though it's probably very inefficient, it probably added up to a lot of time served. So why don't you look at it from that perspective? And since they're doing so many things with money these days in the government, I, I think that they would get a check if you applied for it properly. And I don't know what that magic is because the times or two that I've asked for money for PIP, I don't even get an answer. So anyway, think about it. Thank you, Jim. Newell. Um, if, I can, if I can just uh, make a comment that we are gonna be discussing uh, items related to the fire assessment later on in the meeting. So um, really during public comment, if you can hold those comments till that item, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Newell. Good evening, Newell Hollingsworth, 199th Avenue. This is just a appeal to everyone on their intelligence. There is a drop in the amount of shots being given out for COVID-19. We have had many, many people within our town. At the last look, it was over 800 people that have been infected that have had medical attention. I know of two deaths within our town from COVID. To not get the shots to be that selfish, unless you have a genuine medical reason, is not being very neighborly and not caring about your neighbors. I have had my shots and I've had them for quite a few months. 
because I am over 65. But I will continue to maintain the protocols, including mask wearing, spraying everything with alcohol, social distancing for my neighbors. And I wish everyone else in this town would continue to do the protocols. And if they have not gotten the shot, please get the shot for yourself and for your neighbors so we won't have these calls and we won't have these people sick. I watched a neighbor across the street who was extremely ill for over a month and a half. And he was law enforcement. And he caught it very simply by taking a phone from one of his underlings and answering the phone call he had to take. The gentleman who on the phone three days later came down with it. And then my neighbor came down with it about seven days later. And he was very sick for a very long time. So it is necessary if you have a conscience, if you care about your neighbors, if you care about your community, get the shot. Thank you. Thank you. Final speaker is Debbie Green. Debbie Green, 5201 Southwest 199th Avenue. I really just wanted to commend Representative Robin Bartleman. Um, I can tell you from a personal experience, I have been fighting for an unemployment claim that has been well-deserved for one of my client's employees who's been an employee for 21 years. I know unemployment, the insurance has been paid every year because I pay it. <laughs> And she was not able to work under no fault of her own other than the building wouldn't allow anyone from outside in. So for more than a year, I have been playing along with the state and following all their rules and the websites. And you know, of course, we've all heard in the news how it doesn't work. And it, I can tell you firsthand, it doesn't work. Um, I finally decided, you know, why don't we write a letter? Let's write a letter to the governor to, he wanted, we were gonna send to my boss's representative and his employee's representative. And I said, you know what? Let me also send it to my representative because I've been the one fighting it for a year. <laughs> so I knew I could count on her and I, she came through. Within two days of me sending her the email, she connected me with Gianni. The next day he called me he, within the next day, he filed the uh, legislative claim with all the information I had passed to him. Within the next week, the employee received every penny that was due to her. Nice. So I just wanted to share that we can absolutely count on Representative Bartleman to be there, you know, to reach out. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That's it, Mayor. Excellent. Thank you. All right, um, so uh, any board reports this evening? I, uh, Christina Brownlow would like to speak on that. Would you like me to have her? Okay, yeah, since sure. she's on Zoom? Okay. Sure. Ms. Brownlow, can you hear us? Yes, gentlemen, are you able to hear me? Yes, Chris. Hi, how are you all? Very good. All right, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to speak. I have the uh, joy and the pleasure of being the chair of the parks board this year. And uh, per our last meeting, you know, our focus this year is truly on habitat and habitat preservation. You know, we've taken upon the, uh, the Monarch Pledge and uh, we, as a lot of you know, our certified community habitat with the National Wildlife Federation. We are also focusing on uh, the benefit of pollinators and the pollinators to us. So I thank you all for your support in what the Parks Board is doing with all of that. We are also trying to bring up awareness per the incidents of vandalism that are occurring in our parks. We're Although it is, you know, it's sad. Uh, we, we just want people to be aware, uh, to look out. Please let us know. We are correcting things. 
and I think we're getting a handle on, on it. Uh, we have a wonderful board that is very focused and out there. So thank you, gentlemen, for everything. Uh, thank you, December, as our liaison for what you provide us. And um, I hope that will do, gentlemen. And uh, per uh, Representative Bartleman, I know this is a side note. I'm an educator. She was an educator. And it's such a blessing to have her as part of our community and all that we do. And if I may, I thank her on behalf of the Parks Board for all that she is contributing to us. It is an honor and a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> George Morris, uh, Chair of the Drainage Board. Just uh, wanna touch base real quick. Uh, two months ago, I didn't do a report because we did not have a meeting. Things got rolled over to the next month. Uh, one of the biggest issues were that came to our attention was the surface water management area, potential increase of that area and the need or not the need. We had a, a very healthy, lengthy discussion uh, that went on that night and um, some positive things came out of that. I wanna thank the councilmen for, for attending. Um, appreciate your all the time showing up. Um, on another note, um, I'd like to say thank you everyone, uh, Andy, for, for his staff, the, every councilman, they've been great throughout the pandemic. I'm happy to be here after what, a year and a half, it's been whatever it's been. I think the towns handled the, the whole situation very professionally and made themselves available. I've met with a lot of different councilmen during the, the pandemic. Um, I've had a lot of interactions with the staff, whether it's Julio or whether it's, uh, um, you know, Rod or, or Philip or December. And I just wanna thank everybody for that and making themselves available because it is true. We do have a wonderful community and it's uh, been wonderful and um, welcome back. And so that's pretty much it uh, for my report. Um, thank you. Thanks, George. Any other board reports? All right, seeing none. Um, council member comments. I'll go. All right, thank you. I know you're shocked. <laughs> 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 thank you, Mayor. Thank everybody for coming. Uh, Feels a little strange sitting up here, I feel like. I know I know how uh, Keith's uh, goldfish feel. Um, but uh, we're here and uh, we're functioning and uh, so far it seems everything's working out really well. I wanna say a special thanks again to uh, Rep Representative Bartleman for representing us. I know she's gonna do a great job for us. She's uh, uh, started off with a really big bang. Um, just a couple items of note. Um, one is uh, we have a, the photo shoot uh, at the barn on uh, 7 13, uh, July 13th at 5 p.m. Uh, for all the first responders, doctors, nurses, firemen, retired, active. We want to get as many people as we can in on this. Um, we've got the photography lined up, we've got everything squared away, and it's pretty well planned out. So just to keep reminding everybody about it, and I'm sure Bob's uh, Councilman Hartman's going to talk more about it. Um, it's great to be back in person um, and uh, we'll be probably using the Zoom hybrid for a little while uh, to answer some of those other questions, um, but it's really nice to be back in person and uh, functioning. Um, just want to mention that we have uh, 4th of July coming up and I don't know if we can get this on the camera. You're going to be seeing these signs out in uh, area, areas around town. It's uh, with the 4th of July coming up. It's going to be legally uh, okay for residents to set off fireworks. It's not okay for us because we have so much livestock and horses, uh, cows, goats, you name it. And they, and I'll show it up one more time. So when you see them, it's not uh, trash or debris. The town, is, the town is putting these out to remind everybody that our animals, uh, they don't like fireworks or gunfire or anything like that that goes boom. So I just want to mention that, that we've got that coming. Those will be coming out and they'll be placed around town in, in strategic places. Um, Mr. Kalis, I went by your place today. I agree with you, it's a dump. What I can do about it, I'm not sure. I, hopefully you're listening. Um, I looked at it, it, uh, it really looks bad, it smells bad. Um, I'm not exactly sure what we can do about it, but I, did, I was by there today and I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's, uh, if that's agriculture, then I'm a brain surgeon. 
Um, it's, it's nowhere, anywhere near that. And uh, for people to hide behind agriculture on that, um, I find it a little disconcerting. Um, what we can do about it, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, you are on the radar screen. I just want you to know that. And I'll conclude with, um, I wanna congratulate all the students for the class of 2021. Um, you've had a hard year uh, as the year before. And I just wanna say, you know, uh, well done. A lot of you, my son's a, my son's a teacher right now and he's going through, uh, he's giving me the day-to-day -day stuff on it. And uh, it wasn't anything like when I was a kid, I can tell you that. And also wanna congratulate Madison Sullivan for her Silver Knight Award. Um, that was one of those things when I was uh, growing up and younger that I always kind of looked at it as the Olympics. And like, I don't know if anybody's ever actually met an Olympic gold medalist, but she's, she would be in that same sort of class, you know, and the effort that goes into that. And of course, it's a family effort. Her family had to support her and, and move her along. So the, uh, the mom and dad get a lot of credit also. And I'll conclude with that, Mayor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, folks. Glad to be back here and to be here together again. It's been way too long. Um, we had a country estates meeting out west, and it was so nice to say the Pledge of Allegiance all together, not over Zoom. So welcome back. Uh, Andy, you know, Jim's got an idea that uh, I'm not, ha I haven't heard any discussion on at all regarding the number of COVID cases that the fire department has supported. I'm, I'm not sure if we can get money back, but it'd be a wonderful thing if uh, if we would make a claim and, and get the, the ball rolling to see if we can uh, recoup some of our, our fire expenses um, on the federal dime. If, if that's an option, um, I'd love to hear back from you on it uh, because anyway, we can save money. Uh, just uh, another quick item, uh, Gary mentioned the first responders and frontline workers um, uh, photograph we're going to do out on the barn. Uh, he's right, the, uh, the date is 713 at, uh, at uh, 5 o'clock. We also have two rain dates. If it's raining on the 13th, don't bother showing up. We'll do it also on the 20th or the 27th, so uh, that time of the year. We should be having rain now, but hopefully by July we're having some rain. But uh, we've got a couple of rain dates laid out as well. First responders, if you're a fireman, either for the town or just a fireman in general, either working or retired, uh, or police officer, anything to do with law enforcement, uh, please come on out. And what we mean by frontline workers, people that have been taking care of, uh, of COVID patients, checking them into the hospitals, the clinics, giving shots whatever it takes. We really want to honor the people in our town that have participated in uh, the response to this pandemic. So please come on out. We, we'd love to uh, get a picture of the whole community. And I think we're going to do a centerfold in, in one of our upcoming uh, town newsletters. Uh, George, um, I've actually been out by your way as well, just as Gary has been. Um, I'll give you a call tomorrow to discuss some ideas I've had. So, uh, uh, I think you have our attention for many months now. Um, it's just we're limited on what we can do, but I think we're all putting our, our thinking caps on to try to come up with some good ideas. That's all I have. Thank you. Happy 4th of July, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, David. Let me begin um, thanking everybody coming out this evening. It's um, very important that the residents attend our meetings so you can get one-on-one -on -one with each one of us and, and talk with us and, and let us know what's going on in your neighborhood. And um, that also uh, dovetails into uh, the HOAs. Um, join your HOA, uh, each of those HOAs. Um, most of us uh, up here at, uh, if not all of us appear at the HOAs and um, we want to hear what's going on in your neighborhood. And that is, uh, gives you a, uh, more than a more than a, a two minute comment uh, with, with people that are uh, sitting up here. Uh, you know, during the, uh, one the recent uh, drainage board meeting, um, my neighbor, uh, Ed Gonzalez spoke about uh, the canal cleanouts. And um, I think that's something that's really important 
Um, you drive around and you look down in the, in the canals and you can see how the sediment has collected. And that also adds to um, the Im impacts the uh, drainage. Uh, Mr. Kalis, uh, I hope you're listening. I agree with Gary. Um, you're, you're, when you hide behind a, uh, uh, your, your ag exemption to create a dump, you know, um, I, I agree we need to keep an eye on what's going on with you. Um, the COVID concerns, you know, um, I, I had my COVID vaccine way back in February. And I think it's really, really important, especially with the way variants are coming about that, um, you know, if you don't, uh, if the more we get vaccinated, the more we're going to limit the variants. Uh, with the changes on uh, Zoom, um, where we're now doing public appearances, I would like to see if there's a way that we can do our advisory boards continue with a public appearance on Zoom, that sounds like something um, not necessarily for the, the members because we do have the requirements for a quorum, but um, public appearances at Zoom, uh, via Zoom for these advisory boards, I think um, we should try to work toward keeping um, that accessible to, toward our residents. I'd like to remind everybody that um, the Rural Arts and Advisory Board is uh, the Rural Arts and Design Advisory Board is um, accepting photographs taken by children uh, 13, year old, 13 years old and younger. Now these photos are gonna be showcased in our town newsletter um, and we will be accepting those uh, submissions until further notice. Uh, also the Rural Arts and Design Advisory Board is accepting admissions for the uh, submissions for the 2022 town calendar. Uh, the theme is our parks. So if you go out there and get some photos of our parks, submit, in, submit them in and um, we can uh, have those selected by the advisory board for uh, publication in the calendar. Uh, let's see. I'd like to ask everybody to, uh, if you have not yet, register for code red, code red. Uh, the website through the town website. It's really important. It keeps you up to date when uh, we get emergency situations, especially regarding hurricane season, which we are in right now. Um, and it was uh, pleasant to hear that uh, the country estates drainage project um, was approved by the governor. Uh, it's great to see that there's some really much needed drainage out in the western part of the town. Um, and then uh, uh, Representative Bartleman spoke of a, C, a committee substitute for Senate Bill 60 regarding the anonymous code violations. Uh, lot, when I was back, when I was pr uh, president of the HOA, I received a lot of complaints and uh, I advised my uh, neighbors, you know, there is an option that you can make an anonymous code violation. And, you know, it, you want, our neighbors to feel comfortable and in, in, in saying, you know, uh, I don't want my neighbor to hate me, but I want to preserve what we have here. So, uh, you know, we have a code that protects us in, in, as, as a town. But, um, you know, once everybody is going to be um, told, hey, you know, your neighbor next door reported you, I think the impact of this law, if it's signed by the governor and has not been yet, uh, if it's signed by the law, uh, the governor, the effect will be there will be less reporting of code violations and to put more burden on our code department. Uh, Marianne Allen, when she called in about affordable housing, um, just want to make it known that if, if affordable housing means condensed housing or um, zero lot lines, that's something that's not going to not going to get a vote from me. I'll clearly go, go against that. Um, and, um, you know, I've heard rumors that, you know, uh, I would be in favor of a four laning of Dykes Road. No, it's not going to happen. Not on my watch. Um, and, oh, yeah, uh, there's been some talk about the volunteers. I've heard that around the town. Um, back on November 5th, 
there was a major automobile accident um, west of the Grace Baptist Church. And the first people on the scene were our volunteers. And it wasn't just, you know, a crash or something like that. There was an ejectment, a body was ejected. Some of the driver was ejected from that vehicle. And our volunteers are the first people on the scene. When they arrived, they found the driver not breathing. It was our volunteers that were there. And um, I think our volunteers are important. And last, um, we have a, our next meeting on June 24th. There's a likelihood I will not be here. I have a um, surgery scheduled for uh, June 23rd, the day before, and it had to do with a, a motor vehicle crash a couple of years ago. Um, pain hasn't resolved, so um, I'm gonna undergo some surgery. So I may not be here, I'm gonna try, um, but um, I ask everybody to excuse my presence if I'm not here. That's all I have, Governor, or <laughs> Governor, <laughs> Mayor. Wow. <laughs> Mayor, maybe governor one day, huh? All right. I hope not. <laughs> Jim, please. Mr. Mayor. Everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, staff, and residents, it is quite an honor for me to be standing here this evening as your council member for the town of Southwest Ranches in District 3. If we look back 18 months ago, everyone here was affected by COVID, some more so than others, but it's changed our lives. And since being uh, sworn into office in November, I've had the opportunity to use the Zoom for our council meetings, for our advisory board meetings, and most of all, for the homeowners and civic associations that are here. And I've learned a lot. Uh, I think most of you know I come from a construction background, so public uh, being a public official is very different for me, but I am absolutely thrilled to be able to stand here this evening and look at you and speak to you directly in person. That's the way I, I came up. We had a meeting every Friday night. Every Friday night, I stood in front of the podium for 18 years and spoke to the uh, members. So it's a thrill for me to be able to speak to you tonight. I think most of you know that my campaign was uh, dealt with a lot of speeding and the, in the uh, Southwest Ranches area. I think most of you see that the enforcement has stepped up. You see the officers everywhere. We bought them a new laser gun, four new radar guns. And I've got something here I'd like to share with you real quick. It came in, I get these reports weekly and I'm, I'm really thrilled. In the year uh, 2020, there were 574 tickets written. That's quite a few in this small town. I don't know if they're residents or pass through or what. But as of 2021 today, year today, there's been 627 written. So I imagine by the end of the year, we'll be well over a thousand tickets written. I'm hoping not any of you got those tickets. If so, I think that maybe you'll slow down, I'm hoping. I did buy some green and white signs. I know green and white sounds funny to some people, but that's my colors, I guess. It, it helped me a lot with my campaign, but I bought some green and white signs. If anybody's interested, they're 18 by 12. They're small signs, they go in the yards. And I have them up and down 166, all through Green Meadows, out through Rolling Oaks. Country Estate has some out there. But anybody that's interested in a sign to help slow the people down, you know, I'd be happy to, to do that for you. I do wanna take uh, time, thank Andy, take uh, all of our town staff for all the help that they give me. I come in here on Monday mornings before the meeting and I get handed paperwork and I read through that paperwork from one end to the other. I promise you, I read it. And if I have questions, I can call and get the answers to them so that my decisions that I make for this town is based on something that I've read and done. So I promise you that I'll look after this town. I promise you that uh, any issues that come up, I'll do my due diligence and make sure the town of Southwest Ranches is properly represented. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And I just want to, <clears throat> excuse me, I just want to welcome both David and Jim up here to the, uh, the podium. Um, just a great job you all have done to get here and, and the things you've done in the first six, seven months that you've been on, on the council. Thank you, and it's great to have you up here. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your work. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. 
All right. Um, a few thoughts. I wanted to, um, first of all, um, I wanted to thank uh, Andy, and I wanted to recognize Andy for the work over the last uh, 12 to 15 months um, since this has, COVID has come around. Um, this was uncharted territory. This was um, something that, uh, you know, weekly or daily, the the kind of the, the tea leaves changed and, and the strategies changed and the way to respond changed. Um, and uh, it came out of nowhere. And I just could not have asked for better guidance um, and better direction, um, weighing out the real facts, what's going on, what's safe, what's, what's gonna be right for our town and um, then what Andy did. And I know he had a team and I know he had a lot of help when he did that. And so I'm appreciative to all of them. But Andy, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, you, you not only um, guided us through that, but you, your staff, you and your staff continued to provide service to our town throughout that whole, that whole time period when you know one, one, small, one small slip and we could have been out of business for quite a while. So. Um, just recognize what you did, uh, Russell, the, the amazing things that you did, um, also technology-wise and, and a lot of other ways that uh, you did it. But um, work, they were easier because we were able to tack them together. So I, you know, I thank the entire staff and, and the council and the past council for their support right. through some very, very difficult times. But it uh, looks like we're, we're coming out the other side and uh, we're still standing. So we are. excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I wanted to make a quick comment on uh, one, of the, one of the items that uh, Representative Barlman had mentioned when she was up here. She talked about this pump that uh, is uh, being put in in Pines, and you know normally that like that doesn't affect us. But but there, you know she also made another comment that I just want to pull out, and that is that when we talk about drainage, we can't talk about the drainage in Southwest Ranches unless we're also talking about the drainage in Pembroke Pines and, and all the areas that are surrounding us because water doesn't know town boundaries. Water goes where water goes, we know the lowest level. And so even though, just as, that, as an example, that pump that's going in Pines, um, that's gonna go directly from one of their lakes into the, uh, the canal that goes right along the levee. Um, and any, any water that's pumped out there is water that doesn't have to flow through our town. So it helps us, even though it's has, you know, totally outside our town. So I appreciate that it's being looked at from a really a, a global level, a, uh, um, and, and even things that are happening in other towns can, can still help us. So I want to recognize that and appreciate all her efforts. Um, there was the, the comment about affordable housing. I wanted to just touch on that. We have fought very hard in this town um, to protect our open spaces. Um, we will not give up. We will not, we will not allow that to uh, come in our town. Matter of fact, we've, we, we've addressed it in the past, as Marianne had mentioned. Um, we've had um, strategies in the past that have been very effective and still are very effective. Um, this is just not the right place for, for that type of uh, housing because it, it's not part of the rural lifestyle of who we are. Also, a community like that could change the whole you know, voting structure and priorities of our voters. So it's, it's critical for us to maintain, maintain who we are. So um, there was a question uh, about uh, that, Mel, that Michelle brought up uh, regarding Zoom meetings and can we continue them uh, further past the end of June. Um, unfortunately, we cannot. We have a mandate from the state that will not allow us to do that. Um, it is good to see the, you know, the participation both in the room, but also the participation that continues through Zoom. Um, but unfortunately, that's, that's not an option for us. Um, George Kalis. Uh, George, I just wanted to, um, I wanted to call something out there. You know, you, you have brought up a number of ideas that um, are, are kind of out of the box, which I, I sincerely appreciate. And um, what I'd like to do, uh, Andy, is I'd like to uh, set up a, uh, a meeting um, and I'd like for you to be there. I'd like 
to have George there. I'd like to have Keith there. And um, I don't know if there's, you know, let's think about if there's anybody else should be there. But I would like to uh, really allow George the opportunity to go through some of the thoughts and ideas that he has and, um, and, and work a strategy that we can kind of prioritize those and see um, which ones, you know, if, if we know out of the box, we, it's something we cannot pursue, then let's just call it out and, and put it aside. But I think there are some things that he's brought up that um, we need to investigate and, and see what we can do um, and see if we can finally uh, put this to rest. So I'd, I'd like to get that set up if we could. I appreciate your help on that. Um, and I believe, oh, uh, so one other item I did want to touch on. So there was a uh, item I brought up at the last meeting regarding um, an overlay for 188th. I want, uh, I just want to recognize that I, uh, I heard the council loud and clear in the last meeting. Um, and I, I don't, I don't really see a, uh, an option for that moving forward. So um, I'm just going to put that, put that to rest at this point. Um, and with that, I, uh, I believe that was all my comments. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, legal comments. Sure, Mayor. I'll be super quick. Uh, the only major issue that I've seen in the last two weeks since we last met, our parties are consistently becoming a more and more of a prevalent issue in the town, and that are paid parties, not people having a party at their house. Right. It's people renting their properties for parties. We've had two issues in the last week. On, on some potentially major events at uh, someone's property uh, that we're trying to get control of now, uh, one of which the property owner apparently doesn't even know that it was going to occur at their house. So um, that is something consistently we're dealing with. I spoke to Andy about it earlier today because I, I realized that code has its limitations and they close, um, meaning they go home before some of these parties occur at night on a Saturday night. Uh, he reminded me that residents should continue to call PD uh, to complain of a party. Actually, since it's PD, it can be anonymous too. So, you know, it's not code enforcement. And, um, you know, and to feel free to call PD's non-emergency number uh, because people are afraid to dial 911 a lot of the times. And so uh, Davie Police Department does have a non-emergency number, 954-693-8200. It's online as well. And they should feel free to call that number if they're experiencing excessive noise or a party next door that does not have a permit. So that is the primary issue we're dealing with. I appreciate Newell's comments today on COVID after someone who had it. Um, and in fact, my 12 year old got vaccinated at CVS on, on the corner of Griffin and Flamingo the other day for a second vaccine. And anyone who wants it, you can just walk right in. There was no one there. The pharmacist gave it to him five seconds. We were out of there. So. Stay safe, everyone, and thank you, Mayor. It's great to be back. Hey, Keith, um, can I have just, just one request? You know, with that change in um, the laws about anonymous, if you could maybe write something or get with uh, Andy, I'd, I'd like to put something in the newsletter to let our residents know what has happened. Sure, Mayor. And, and one thing I, I should state, and it's sort of like a conduit, but uh, there are so many loopholes in that dumb law, I can't even tell you. There's nothing prohibitive. I know Council Member Kaczynski mentioned before when he was president of the HOA, people would call him all the time with code complaints. There's nothing wrong with a resident calling you with a code complaint and then you checking it out or just registering it, uh, it as yourself as the complainant or the manager, town manager as the complainant. And that's so there are so many ways to get around that requirement. Um, but if the town council desires to have a consistent policy, of, of just having residents tell you when there's a, a code issue, if they're afraid to call it in themselves, just list yourselves as the complainant. And you know that's an easy way around it. And when homeowners uh, then see why did the mayor, why did the council member so-and-so complain, at least then you have a policy in place saying, nope, we're the complainant for everyone who doesn't want to state their name. Right. So it is an easy way to get around it if that's so um, the desire of the council. Okay, thank you. So that means when somebody calls me, I can say, I'm Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, now that you bring that up, on Facebook, turns out there is more than one Steve Breikrus out there. So if you've gotten a recent uh, invite from Steve Breikrus, uh, it's, you know, it, well, it may have been me, but probably it wasn't me. Um, so 
somebody is uh, spoofing me. So, um, but yeah, yeah, I guess we can swap around, swap around ideas. All right, awesome. Thank you, Keith. Appreciate that update, uh, Andy. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. First of all, it's a pleasure to have everybody back in the building. And some way since our last meeting in here, it feels like it's been yesterday, and it also feels like it was a lifetime ago. So it is very nice to be back here. One of the things I spoke to before and Robert, uh, uh, Representative Bartleman spoke to was the relationship and the communication that we have. Just want to let you know that's continued this evening, even during the meeting, because she, she is listening to the meeting, even though she's not here anymore. And she heard the comments about affordable housing. And I just want to point out that she was not speaking in terms of Southwest ranches or looking to do something like that here. She was speaking much more on the, the macro level within her district, within South Florida, and with issues within Broward County. Because affordable housing is, while it may be something that, that we don't want the higher densities in Southwest ranches, it is a problem in South Florida. And that's just for the record, she was speaking more to the larger problem as opposed to looking to do something like that in Southwest ranches. So uh, I want the residents' minds to be put at ease about that. Thank you. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention in keeping with our reopening the building, uh, we've reached out to DMV. And as you may recall, we had DMV in here to do driver's licensing issues once, once a month here in council chambers, which was hugely popular with our residents. And, and I'll tell you that in the, the 15 months or so that we've been closed to the public, that, that may be one of the most frequent questions that we've had. When, when is that coming back? So the good news is we've reached out to them. They're coming back on a site visit at the end of June. And it looks like we'll have them back in July. And obviously we'll promote that to the public at the time. But I just want to go ahead and share that with you as the world continues to open up. That's one of the things that we're looking to bring back, something that's been very, very popular with our residents. Excellent. And that, that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it, Andy. All right. Uh, resolutions. Item number 10, Russell. This is a resolution of the Town Council of the Town of Southwest Ranches, Florida, approving a lease agreement and a maintenance contract with Toshiba American Business Solutions, Inc. for three copier printer scanners, providing for severability, providing for conflicts, and providing for an effective date. Make a motion to approve. Make a motion. Second. Motion and a second. Um, any council comment before I open up to the public? Seeing none, um, open it up to the public for comment. Any Zoom comment? No hands raised, Mayor. Zoom session closed. Any public comment in town council chambers? Seeing none, Mayor, back to you for deliberation. Great, thank you. Um, seeing no further comment, Russell, if you could please call the roll. Certainly, Mayor. Council Member Albritton? Yes. Council Member Jablonski? Yes. Council Member Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Hartman? Yes. Mayor Breakfast? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number 11. Item number 11 is a resolution of the Town Council of the Town of Southwest Ranches, Florida, approving the issuance of a purchase order in an amount not to exceed $14,000.00 to sound planning distributors for a new camera system for the Town Council Chambers, providing for severability, providing for conflicts, and providing for an effective date. Mayor, before we entertain a motion on that, I would like to just speak on this issue really quickly, if I could. Absolutely. The uh, This was an approved project in the fiscal year 21 budget. Uh, we had allocated $20,000 uh, for this project, and we uh, let out a request for uh, uh, proposals on this project. Uh, we received three different uh, proposals on it, and uh, the lowest price came in at $13,000 uh, from sound planning, well, well below the uh, budgeted amount for it. Uh, in reviewing the spec and uh, talking it over with um, one of your colleagues on the town council, it was suggested that we look at the cameras that were proposed, which were 1080p or high definition cameras, and actually go to a higher level technology, which is 4K, which at this point is maybe a little bit of overkill, but in the future it will probably be the standard and it seems prudent. Right. It was spec as, as the 1080p just to keep the price down. Uh, we went back to the lowest uh, proposer and asked him about that. He reworked his spec and I've provided that to you here. We have a copy up here for anybody who's interested. And the revised amount now with two 4K cameras is now 14,739, so higher than what's indicated in the resolution. What I'd also like to do is to have council uh, entertain a motion to approve, if, if you'd be so kind to do so, uh, in an amount not to exceed $16,000, which would still be lower than the second 
uh, Lois Proposer in case there's any contingencies. So it would cover the, uh, the 4K cameras and any other contingencies that may arise. Very good. Thank you, Russell. Mm -hmm. Do I have a motion? On so a motion to approve, not to exceed $16,000. Second. Okay. Russell, are there any Zoom comments? I did not see any uh, members of the uh, Zoom community. Zoom uh, comment closed. Chamber comment? Chamber comment closed. Mayor? Great. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate the, uh, I just want to make a quick comment that I, I do think this is important to have. Um, it will, I think in the long run, actually save us money. And, um, and it's just, it, it's more interactive with our residents and will be a positive thing going forward. So any further council comment on this item? <clears throat> All right, seeing none, Russell, if you could please call the item. Certainly, Mayor. Council Member Albright? Yes. <clears throat> council Member Jablonski? Yes. Council Member Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Hartman? Yes. Mayor Breikers? Yes. Motion passes, Mayor. All right, excellent. Um, the next item is an item that I requested to be put on the agenda to be discussed. It's a discussion item having to do with the um, the fire assessment and an update on that. Um, we have, uh, as I think everybody's aware, the last couple of years we've had some challenges with the fire assessment. And so one of the things when I uh, uh, took office, I wanted to make sure that I, uh, we were looking at what was happening, um, try and, and head off any issues as early as possible and give us as much time as possible to react and to adjust. And so um, when we were going through the items, we found that uh, a lot of the items that were previously looked at um, seemed to be under control, not, not uh, um, they were as, as they were resolved, they were still out there. So, um, you know, they, they, they were still in a good shape. So I think we were okay there. The, uh, however, as we went through this, um, it became very apparent that the mix in um, calls has changed significantly. And what we're seeing is that over the last year, um, the calls from, a res from residents has increased uh, significantly. Um, what this translates to is that, um, as we'll see as we get into the presentation, I'm not gonna- Couple gonna, minutes, uh, couple Chris minutes. To really go through the presentation. Um, which we'll explain in a lot more detail. But what you'll see is that the residence portion of the, uh, the uh, fire costs is going to increase um, because, and I think it's a direct relationship to a year of COVID where um, a lot more folks in their house. And so that leads to a lot more calls from the homes. And that means that the percentage of calls from homes has increased significantly. And so that's, that's kind of the source of it. So, so normally we wouldn't have this discussion until we got into the budget season, which is still a little ways away. But um, I wanted to highlight this and bring it out as soon as possible so that we had as much time to hear resident uh, feedback on it and to look at other alternatives. Um, we have been discussing internally some alternatives that we'll be presenting this evening so you can kind of see what we're looking at and, um, and, and understand the figures with us. Also, everything that we're looking here uh, tonight, uh, you'll be able to find online as well. So, so with that introduction, Chris, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you. I appreciate you putting together the PowerPoint. I appreciate you uh, partnering with uh, Marty and the administrative staff to do this. And, and by the way, let me just say that Marty is on this call. Um, he's on vacation, yes. uh, but uh, he's still here with us. So Marty, thank you for your, uh, your commitment to uh, walking us through this process as well. Yes, Mayor, I'm gonna start off. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor. I'm okay, Marty great. Sherwood. Thank you, uh, Town Financial Administrator. Uh, as a may, excellent introduction, Mayor, just want to remind everybody tonight, this is only an open discussion uh, feedback. We're going to get involved heavily uh, during our June 24th meeting, uh, which starts a process with our volunteer fire component and then move into uh, the initial rate setting in July and then the final rate setting in September. Uh, so 
Uh, we do have Chris Wallace in attendance uh, on the podium tonight, and we're going to tag team uh, this uh, PowerPoint presentation. I want to the deadlines, uh, Mayor, and we wish the best with Council Member uh, Kaczynski, of course. Uh, we wish him the best and, and hope he's with us with the 24th. But we're glad to provide this with you tonight. We need as much feedback from you as possible. Uh, next slide, please. We're going to go into an overview of uh, the determination of basically uh, this four components determine uh, what are Southwest Ranch's taxpayers pay and how much the town receives for specifically the special fire assessment. Uh, there are four categories, the overview what we're gonna cover tonight. I'll take care of uh, number one, which is the utilization. I'll give you the introduction as to the uh, fire service, which the mayor also uh, indicated the results uh, for this past year. Uh, Chris will go into the exemptions, number two, uh, that are provided by the town. Uh, number three is our detailed methodology considerations. And the fourth component is the cost to be included. Now the cost, we're gonna be covering that more on June 24th, uh, just so you're all prepared. Yes, costs did go up, but uh, in the neighborhood of 200,000, about 80% or, or 160,000 is basically uh, our contractual commitments. So costs are not gonna be covered uh, in detail tonight. Uh, the one, two, and three, are the major components as it relates to our fire methodology that we wanna have open discussion uh, and provide you all with options under consideration. So let's move to number one utilization with the fire service categories. Uh, next slide, please. Excellent. Okay, this is our current categories of fire service calls. And these are our utilization considerations. Now with our current methodology, we are using a five-year rolling average. Uh, that means um, every five years are brought forward and re-averaged. And off to the right, you, you see the column that says current. Uh, current is actually the years 2015 to 2019. And that is our current allocation apportionment uh, percentages as it relates on a per category basis. And why I am have you all fixed as to the current uh, categories, I want you to look to the other side, the far left under 2020, and you will see uh, on a one year, that's, that's our actual fire response data for calendar year 2020 on a one year basis. And you will see that every category declined. Uh, acreage, 5.47 to 5.19. Uh, and I won't go through each one, uh, but I wanna give you an overview that the part of the reason why the shock and the increase in our residential is every category uh, on the left in 2020 declined except the residential response data. And how dramatic as it was because of the COVID-19 ramification and everybody being home, you see our current, which is 2015 to 2019, went from, which is an average, 56.08, uh, went to 71.43%. So when you look, to our five-year average, move your eyes two columns over left to right on our five years new average from 2016 to 2020, the allocation percentage jumps from 56% to 65%. So that is a big reason why we have an increase as it relates to residential portion. And all the other categories have five-year averaging down. Uh, so uh, it's time for Chris to take over. Uh, I'll be online and we'll open it for discussion uh, later on. Uh, Chris, can you hear me? Uh, we can move on to the next slide. 
Okay, Marty, thank you. Um, Chris Wallace, Immunolytics, 7320 Griffin Road, Suite 102 in Davie. Um, the next slide, uh, just kind of touch on uh, some of the uh, exemptions that the city offers or the town offers. Um, commercial agricultural is a big classification. Um, statutes uh, pr prescribe some of these exemptions. The town uh, provides uh, some exemptions or not really exemptions, but consolidation with residential. Just to rehash uh, last year, um, some of these agricultural properties were assessed based upon uh, commercial or warehouse industrial uses. Um, the commission or the council wanted to go back and look at that. And uh, so now it's basically, if you have a house with uh, uh, a barn on it, a large barn, agricultural use, you're only gonna get one assessment. If you're um, a, a nursery, for instance, you're only gonna get the same assessment as a residential structure would get. Uh, the town also affords totally dis Uh, exempt. You really can't assess them. If you did assess them, they won't pay. If they don't pay, you can't foreclose on them in Florida. So governmental properties uh, just don't have any assessments to them. But they also have very few calls for service in the town. Um, if I could go back just to that previous slide uh, before this, I just want to, uh, many of you know this, but I think it bears repeating. When we're talking about assessments, the, the fire department is really a fire rescue department and we cannot assess for calls for rescue. So when we look at calls for service, we just strip out all the, all the calls that don't benefit property. Most of these are EMS calls. And what left, what's left is uh, basically fire or fire services that benefit property. And those are the calls that we look at. And so the fire budget uh, we strip into components, uh, fire and then rescue or EMS, if you will. And we only apportion out the fire costs and then we allocate those costs based upon activities in each of these categories. Now, uh, later on, we're gonna see the, the town, obviously everyone here knows is largely residential. While you do have some commercial and warehouse industrial and institutional properties, uh, relatively speaking, it's not a lot of your tax base and it's not a lot of structure space either. They, they, they can have a disproportionate calls for services sometimes and we've seen that in the institutional class. So if we can go uh, up three, uh, uh, Two more slides. One more. Um, maybe we skipped something, I'm not sure. It should be the slide that uh, factors influencing rates. Okay. So the factors that influence rates are the proportions of calls for service in each category. This is the big one. So you're largely residential, you would expect to see the residential category absorb most of the cost. That's the case here. But you did notice a big jump uh, from one year. Uh, largely, we expect uh, that came from people staying at home and not going out. So uh, you didn't have activities as much in the commercial and industrial areas. People just stayed at home and that probably generated more calls for service. It obviously in a one year period, if you were doing that, you'd have a lot of volatility uh, from last year to this year. And this is why the town smooths this out over five years. Um, but the, uh, you know, you're not gonna be just looking at one year, even with five years though, it, because it's heavily weighted in residential and because that changed so much, the five year average uh, is still a, a particularly big jump this year. The cost of service is the next biggest component. Obviously the more costs you have for fire, the more it's gonna be distributed out to the uh, different categories that you have. Uh, one of the issues is a lot of cities, municipalities um, subsidize the fire assessment. Uh, the town's notable that it uh, tends to have a policy of recovering about 100% of its fire costs back from each of the categories. Uh, that's not always the case. In fact, it's not usually the case in most cities. They tend to buy that down. And then we're going to look at uh, something this year that, uh, you know, we're concerned about volatility between some of these non-residential categories. So we're gonna look at uh, either discrete or blended. Discrete is basically the categories that you have now, which is uh, you know, acreage and residential and other, which is generally uh, barns and such. Um, 
a commercial, warehouse, industrial, institutional, and governmental. Uh, we're going to look to blend, maybe consider, uh, we're not making a decision tonight, obviously, but we're going to consider maybe combining uh, commercial and warehouse and institutional together to eliminate the, the volatility, kind of uh, jump them all into one category. The response protocols aren't markedly different, I don't think, from, uh, from one category to the next. Because you have uh, uh, not that much square footage in e any of those categories, um, it might make sense to do that. We've done this in some other cities, particularly with the institutional that uh, you know became very volatile in some neighboring cities. Uh, so it may be something you want to consider here. So these are the, the three the, the three drivers are going to be the proportion of the calls for service that each category has, uh, the costs of the service. Obviously, fire services are very expensive services to provide, and uh, whether or not they get subsidized the, the to any degree by the general fund, and then of course maybe trying to blend these together to eliminate some of the volatility that can drive property owners crazy over time. We can go to the next slide. I threw this slide in, uh, this is your current taxable value. Now taxable value has nothing really to do with the assessment other than it's kind of, they go hand in hand, I think many times. But the taxable value is based upon the value of your property less any exemptions. Um, and as you can see, the taxable value in, in the town of Southwest Ranches for this current calendar year is 88% of your taxable vet value base is residential. 3% is commercial, half of 1% is industrial, 8% uh, is agricultural, and 0.2% uh, is institutional, and then 0.3% is sundry other things. So you can see it's very largely residential, and you can see the, the, the commercial side, the commercial and institutional and industrial uh, doesn't even add up to 4%. So this may be a, ca a case where we do look at blending these three categories together um, to see if uh, you know, it makes sense to do that. Now, agricultural uh, in the assessment scheme of things is, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about that a lot last year, but it's handled mostly like residential. So we could actually add from a tax base point of view, the agricultural and residential, and you'd be in the 96% of the uh, of town's tax bases falling into those two categories. So it shouldn't be surprised that your residential rate's gonna be absorbing most of these costs over time. Um, but this, I would still differentiate when we're looking at assessments. Uh, in general terms, the assessments, for special assessments, you have to have a special benefit to a property and the costs have to be fairly apportioned to each property. So uh, that's how your assessment is done. That's how it's gonna continue to be done. But it, it really does kind of mirror what you see in the taxable value of the town. And we can go to the next slide, please. This slide's a little busy, but it's basically broken into two components. The top part is uh, what we call the discrete. These are your current categories and the rates that would be generated based upon a three-year, which is the top slide, 2A, or a five-year average, which is what we currently use in 2B. The bottom two slides or, or sections of this slide Table 2C is a three-year blended where we combine commercial warehouse and institutional together. And 2D is the same way, but basically you're using a five-year blended average. And you can see the difference in rates that uh, uh, occur because of this. Now, now, we're not shopping rates. We're just trying to figure out what's the best long-term solution for the town to come up with. Uh, you know, should we blend it? Should it be discrete? Should we go back to three years or should we use five years as we currently do? Those are two big decisions that we'll need to decide here uh, as, the, as we move along in the budget cycle. Um, then we can go to the next slide and we, we can come back to these when, uh, when we're finished if anyone has questions on it. So this is just uh, uh, shows you the detail of how we get there. When we use a three year average, uh, you can see that the, the classes are off to the left the number of units is either square feet, acreage, or uh, the number of units on a, you know, if you have two houses on a lot, then they pick up two units. Um, so you see the difference between three and five years in these, in these uh, cases. The only difference is the units never change. You have 302,000 square, 302, square feet of commercial, 548,000 of institutional, which are schools, churches, uh, 
uh, graveyards, things like that. There's a lot of stuff in that category, but uh, that's, that's still not a lot of square footage. And then warehouse industrial is only 109,000 square feet. So none of that really adds up uh, when you start dividing it by the calls for service. It can be volatile from time to time. And you saw that in an earlier slide. I think one of the things uh, we, we try to encourage is maybe stability in tax rates and assessments so people can plan a little bit better and you don't every year have to explain why you know the calls went up for residential because of COVID and then they went down for other categories. You could run into some all sorts of bizarre things if you use a small uh, measuring period. Um, so then we'll go to the next slide. This shows uh, if we blend the commercial warehouse and institutional together, you can see you still have under a million square feet total, which may sound like a lot, but uh, it really isn't. Um, and the percentages change, the dollars change, the rates change per square foot. Um, but this is basically on the three years and five years. So again, the things I guess we need to consider since the costs are the costs are uh, how you feel about the three-year uh, rolling blended versus a five-year rolling blended or a three year as it is currently, or a five year as it is currently. And we'll just go to the last slide or the next to last slide. Um, so this slide shows what happens when the general fund contributes $100,000 to the assessment, basically buys down the assessment. Obviously all the rates come down for, uh, uh, for each category, you know, either by square foot acreage or a number of units. And uh, depending on whether you use a three-year rolling or a five-year rolling average, they produce different rates. We use $100,000 because you can just multiply that, that out by multiples. So if, say, for instance, you said $250,000, it would be easy just to multiply 2.5 times all the savings and you would see the rates accordingly. Um, and that brings us to the, um, the last slide. Uh, and this one's for Marty, I think. And you already covered this to some extent earlier. If Marty's still with us, and yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, Marty, yes, are you, uh, that's uh, you correct. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, the, for the cost of service, we'll go into detail costs. Uh, that will be discussed further June twenty fourth meeting. And as I mentioned, eighty percent of that cost is already increased due to contractual requirements. And I'll turn that back to you, Mayor. Uh, the previous slide, which was uh, prepared by Munalytics uh, regarding the 100,000 general fund contribution uh, is the option to devi deviate away from 100% full cost recovery. Uh, we came up with a rough guesstimate just as it relates to the residential component. Uh, should you choose the five-year uh, blended or five-year discrete, um, it's still uh, projected to be uh, an increase from 639 to $761. And to bring that down from $761 to $639, it would take in the neighborhood of 500,000 of general fund contribution, uh, moving away from full cost recovery. So uh, I wanted to put that on the table, um, I, uh, just so you're aware, uh, but if you would like to move away from uh, full cost recovery, we'd like to discuss that also tonight. Um, and so you're also aware it is scheduled, the change in rates from 639 to 761, uh, primarily due to a uh, utilization represents about a 20% increase in the residential rate. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to the mayor. Great, thank you, Marty. Um, so now that you you kind of seen the presentation, I think you know why we wanted to bring this out uh, to the residents as quickly as possible um, so that we could get your feedback, uh, get your thoughts. Um, as has been laid out here, we do have some different options on different ways to approach this. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, the dollars are the dollars. So, um, so with that, I want um, to. Let me just make one other comment that when I looked at this, 
um, I, when I looked at the, you know, the one year, the three year, the five year, I think it makes sense to spread it over the longest period of time to smooth out these bumps as much as possible. We're already five years. I think it makes sense to stay at five years, but certainly want to hear other folks' um, thoughts on that. As far as the blended versus the discrete that we just walk through currently we are discrete um, but we have seen some things I don't know if, uh, if you picked up on it or not but in the one year scenario for um, industrial uh, there were no calls last year so if we were on a one year rate which we're not smoothing we're on a five year but if we were on a one year um, their fire assessment would be zero because they had no calls. So, so the smaller that, you know, that, that scenario is, that the time frame is, the more jumps we're going to see one way or the other, which I think is not good for anybody. Um, so to smooth things out, the five-year, I think, makes sense. And frankly, to smooth things out, I think combining the institutional, the industrial, and the commercial um, is an option we should look at. Now, that's a change from what we're doing today. Um, so definitely worth discussing. Um, but I think that that could be something that also could smooth out some of the bumps. We, you know, we had a, a, a presentation earlier um, during public comment about the increases that uh, those, some of those areas are seeing. So um, I think that might be something that could help smooth out that as well. So those are just my general comments. Um, and I want to open it up to the council first, if there's any uh, immediate comments to the presentation we've seen, and then definitely open it up to the public as well. Yeah. Yeah, Go Steve, ahead. I agree with you on the five year. I mean, COVID, let's hope was a blip. Right. Let's hope we're getting past that now. And to really penalize for a one year um, anomaly doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, these five, these should be done in five year studies. So in, in my mind, to, to kind of smooth over that, to normalize the numbers a little bit better, it makes a lot of sense. I haven't had the opportunity to think through the second part of your comment yet in terms of mixing the categories, but I, I, I'd like to think about that. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, David. Steve, yeah, I, I, I concur with Bob. Um, I would see that the um, uh, stay-at-home order uh, during the last year um, created an anom anomaly, as uh, Council Member Hartman put it. Um, that was actually the word I had wrote down here exactly. Um, and I think spreading out over the five years um, would be uh, more appropriate. Right. Yeah, Jim. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I got a question. Uh, the um, study deals with just fire, it doesn't deal with rescue. So would that eliminate what Mr. Lansky spoke about, about maybe getting some type of reimbursement? Uh, if it deals with just a fire, uh, I don't think they reimburse for that. But if it was ambulance taking somebody to the hospital for COVID, they would. Is that what it deals with, strictly fire and not uh, rescue? Well, I think uh, I think it's definitely something that's worth looking into to seeing what it does. But you you make a valid point. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, if I could. Yeah. Um, I think obviously a five-year rolling average is going to give a better feel, grasp of the statistics. I mean, uh, a one-off year is, I don't think we should make any decisions based on that. Right. Having said that, as a top-of-the-line statement, now we need to look at the finer print. Do we want to blend categories? Do we want to keep them separated? Um, the number, the, the grand total number is not going to change, but it, the, the blended categories is going to change. Yes. For some people. Um, and you're right about the where the warehouse being zero. Um, but I that zero could turn into 10 tomorrow. It could. Yeah. So I think we need to count that in terms of uh, I, I'm more leaning toward the blended category than as opposed to the standalones that we've had before. Yeah. So just that's and I'm just commenting on the methodology, not on the not on the actual number. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and that, and that's a great point. That thank you for bringing that out. That what we're talking about here is the methodology. We will be, as it was said in the presentation, we'll be talking about the actual numbers and the components, the cost, piece, the next time we get together. Um, so yeah, what we're talking about here is the methodology, which is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm I'm all I'm sorry, playing with my new toy here. Uh, <laughs> supposed to help me here. <laughs> um, 
I'm all for the the five year rolling average. And after you know looking at it totally in the scenario I just gave you of uh, uh, of using a blended uh, categories, I think will give us a better number, uh, a better overall number. Uh, there may be a winner and there may be a loser in this, um, but that'll only be the, the initial initial year, I believe. Right, and I think it'll give us has the opportunity to give us more stability going forward. Yeah, I I, I concur with that. Great, great, appreciate that. Yeah, go ahead. I, I would just like to add, um, as I was going through the review uh, and listening, um, <clears throat> I'm sure that everybody will hear, will agree that uh, we all still support um, that the nurseries uh, would be still assessed as uh, residential. Uh, one, one fee is residential. And then if a residence also has a barn it would be uh, assessed with one structure. I'm sure that everybody would be sitting up here would be a, uh, in agreement of that. That's correct. Make sure that well, I, and I, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. I think, and I think your assessment is correct. Um, but you, <clears throat> you bring up a great point that I did want to uh, kind of reinforce, and that is that um, you know when we when we're still a couple of months, several months away from when those tax notices are going to arrive at your at your doorstep, we have tried to go through and look at some of the issues that have happened in the past to make sure that they were not reoccurring. Um, but we can't look at everybody's property. And so please, I'm just encouraging you that when those bills come out, and if you see something that has radically changed, please, please, please contact us as soon as you possibly can so that uh, we have the opportunity to um, handle situations as quickly and as early on in the process as possible. It's a whole lot easier to, to address issues earlier on in the process than later on in the process. So. All right, so with that, um, I'd like to open it up to the public for their uh, feedback sure. and thoughts and recommendations. Sure, Mayor. Um, because it's a discussion item, if you could just please advise the parameters. We'll start with Zoom first. You want two minutes per person? Um, yeah, so two minutes. You know, so you all may have noticed that my um, my restriction on time is is pretty loose. Um, I would like to uh, generally restrict it to two minutes, um, but please stay stay on topic. Please, um, you know, uh, please try not to repeat yourself. Things like that. You know, as so long as good information is 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 coming out, um, I, I don't normally cut folks off. But uh, try and just out of respect for everyone else, we can try and keep it around two minutes. I would much appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mayor, we'll start with Zoom. Okay, hey, Mayor. So the first speaker is Marianne Allen. Ms. Allen, Hello, can you hear us? Council members, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, I'm talking for the equestrian community with Barnes, and there was a lot of um, horrible things done last year where people were getting bills for thousands of dollars for an old barn. And we're not commercial like Home Depot, where we're bringing in a lot of income. The other thing is, um, I think it's highly egregious that in a year where most people have businesses here in Southwest Ranches, and they were all impacted, they weren't making money last year. How egregious is it is to raise taxes after that? It's an insult, it's, it's criminal. And it just reminds me of mafia days where they say, hey, Oh, uh, you need some fire protection, folks, you know, and you got to pay it. When are we going to stop with these increases and say enough? Um, sharpen your pencils, okay, like most accountants do. Look where in your budget you can start deducting from other areas, but you just can't keep going back to the milk cow over and over again, especially with the devastation that most of us went through with the pandemic last year and not being able to work and bring an in income. I think this is highly insulting, it's egregious, and it's going to impact so many of our residences. And you've got to push back. Why are they increasing it? I don't understand it. And I'd like for you to understand the residents plight in this situation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you. Uh, Russell, any more Zoom speakers? <laughs> There are no other uh, Zoom speakers. Zoom sessions closed. At this point, we'll open up to count, to uh, chamber comments, Mayor. Thank you. So if you just uh, come one by one to the podium and Russell will start the clock. Uh, no Hollingsworth, 199th Avenue. When this was being 
churned back last year, uh, back in September. It was decided that we would take a look and we'd take a look at the definitions and we'd take a look at the categories. And if we needed additional categories, we would add them at that point in order to have a different rate for different areas. I didn't hear any of that tonight. What I heard was collapsing categories. I didn't hear any new definitions or something that had been redefined differently. What happened to all that? Where'd it go? Here we are at the 10th hour, not the 11th hour, not 1130, but at the 10th hour. When I was hoping that this would come back two months ago, at least, so we could start a reasonable discussion. And we haven't done that. Where are the new definitions? Where are the new categories? If there is going to be categories, and if there isn't, why isn't there new categories? What people were talking about back in August and September of last year. Thank you. I mentioned earlier that uh, I read a little bit. I'm not going to say I can remember it verbatim, but Leon County, when they did their performance audit, also claimed the benefit of technology. And I remember a while back, this guy here came to you with the idea of how many technolo te technological advancements have been made with an iPhone, like a 12G uh, uh, heart study and stroke intervention, which you've seen down in Miramar, but we're not allowed to do it here. We don't even know what kind of tools that we have on those trucks that are relatively cheap now to lower some of our cost. Uh, why don't we look at it from that standpoint? And if you increase the benefit, you increase the value of whatever assessment you're gonna come up with. But we need to analyze those calls better and see you know, what it takes. If we got a guy that we obviously is having a stroke, don't send the fire truck along with him. And that's another thing, the fire truck. You know, I don't know how much we get charged when somebody like Davy or Pembroke Pines has to back up because one of our units is down. There must be some cost. There must be some utilization of other departments. I'm sure they bill us for it. And I mean, I know when Lowe's or somebody gets an emergency over there, Every fire truck that ain't got nothing to do shows up to give them a bill. That I know. I've seen it in action. So why don't we break this stuff down, like I suggested the other day, and analyze the calls and what went on there. And then you can forecast what your uh, liability is going to be in the future and how you can do a better job. So anyway, just let's keep thinking along those lines instead of, you know, who we're going to charge. I would look at bringing the cost down, just like I believe Marianne said. All right. Hey guys, Chase Pepper again. Uh, so I have this study from July 30th, where you have this PowerPoint fire assessment. I don't know if you guys have really read in depth, uh, but there are different rates here for institutions went from 25 cents to a dollar and 21 cents. Okay, while as you mentioned, the industrial went down from 160 to 54. Uh, there's a few things I wanted to touch on. Number one, the legal requirements. Assessment must be fairly and reasonably be apportioned according to the benefits received. Morris versus Town of Cape Coral and Sarasota County versus Sarasota Church of Christ. Uh, so that's good to know. There's a few more things here I wanted to mention. So in the study itself, it says the methodology, the town also has significant institutional properties, which include houses of worship, non-public schools, most of which are owned by religious organizations, cemeteries, and sundry other uses. Uh, other institutional category includes nursing homes, substance abuse centers, healthcare facilities, uh, funeral homes, mausoleums. And so the, this is the category that, that's being raised. Uh, additionally, you mentioned that the tax value table, uh, the institutional was like 0.5% or, or whatever it was. Uh, I don't really think that's reflective of the reality because, as you know, taxable value, and you're, you're trying to talk about taxable value with churches, it's uh, apples and oranges. Um, 
and you mentioned something about square footage from this study appendix table C, BCPA fire class counts. All right, you have the highest category with square footage is 551,000 square foot in institutional. So not only is it the, the highest uh, rate per square footage, the, as a category, it's the highest most square footage out of all the categories which are measured in square foot. And adding to that, these are, these are the religious institutions that, that you guys are, are raising on. So let me consider. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other members of the public wishing to speak? Good evening, Council. John Eastman, 188th Avenue. Uh, I think we should stick with the five-year plan because, like you said, it smooths this last year over. Hopefully, we won't have a repeat of it. Uh, I'm, I'm all for 100% recovery and uh, no general revenue sharing. We need transparency. The, the taxpayers need to know exactly what the fire and rescue fees are, so we can't be blending in other fees and it is what it is. It might be unpleasant, but let's uh, let everybody know what the actual cost is. Um, no blending. And I think that uh, if there are more categories to consider, bring them in, throw them in the mix. The, uh, the main problem is, is the costs. You know, we pay more in the ranches than anyone else in the county, pretty much one of the highest rates in the state. So there's a a problem here with the, the Davy contract, we're paying a lot of uh, overhead to Davy. They're billing us for their overhead. It's very unfair. The cost of a fire, fire truck, the cost of having a men there are a fixed cost, but the soft costs in the contract need to be addressed. We're being really taken advantage of big time with soft costs. And I think that um, maybe we need to renegotiate the contract with them because it's getting out of control. And, you know, I'm, I've been hammering on the, the volunteers. I'm not saying they don't do a great job, but there's a lot of, a lot of expenditures there that we can cut back on. And, uh, you know, for me as a resident to have to pay over $700 a year, uh, it's really getting out of control. So let's look at the costs and then worry about, you know, how to apportion it and everything. But uh, wherever we are with the Davy contract, maybe we can look at other options again. We have a new sheriff in Broward. Has anybody approached him? Can we work with him? He might come back and give us a decent rate. Thank you. Thanks, John. That's it, Mayor. Oh, Debbie, sorry. In, in looking at the five year average did you all Debbie, could you please just oh. state your name oh sorry debbie Thanks. debbie green Thank you. 199th avenue in in looking at the the averages the three-year and the five-year averages we have 2020 which as we all said it's, it's it's an anomaly so if you look at 2020 knowing that it is what it is but then look at it a five-year average at a more normal five-year average and look at 2015 to 2019 so that you can also then see how averaging in that 2020 year in that five years, how what effect is that having on that on that average and how it's pulling it down. So I don't know if that's something that you can look at. Okay. And as far as looking at cost, and I'll just say, I mean, I, th I don't think the volunteer fire department is. I, I think part of the problem like was in the presentation is the contract with Davy, And that's where a, both of these costs are coming from. And we just need to just all keep in mind that we just need to keep proper coverage throughout the entire town at an effective level. Okay. Thank you, Debbie. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the feedback from the public on this. This is obviously not uh, a topic that <clears throat> is enjoyable to talk about, but to get it out there as soon as possible. Um, I did want to make a couple comments based on things that I heard. Um, it was a question, why didn't we get this out sooner? Um, we're bringing it out sooner than we ever have in the past. So um, uh, I would have liked to have brought it out sooner, but there, you, you, we were looking at a lot of different options. We were going through the data. Chris has spent a lot of time on it. Marty spent a lot of time on it. We 
uh, Andy and I, we, we've all been meeting on this nearly on a weekly basis um, since I've been elected. So uh, it, it, we have not let any time pass um, without looking at this. So we, we were balancing getting it to in front of the residents as soon as possible versus you know, giving you good information to talk about and rather than just speculating. So um, as far as new categories versus breaking down categories, uh, earlier on we did talk about new categories, but if you look at the numbers here, um, I think the, the whole reason why potentially collapsing the categories, uh, not including residential, but the institutional, industrial, and commercial together, um, is you can see on these numbers, and I would encourage you to, to go back and, and look at them a little bit more, um, just because there's a lot there, um, and um, that by having as many as we have today, the fluctuations in those areas is, makes it very difficult for those entities to predict and budget and count on what that number is going to be. Um, if we created more categories, we would just exacerbate that even more. So I, I don't think that's the solution. I think that the, uh, the solution could be um, looking at collapsing those so that it's more, um, more, it's steadier and more predictable year over year. Um, right, so those are a couple comments I wanted to make. I don't know, any other comments uh, from the council on this? Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, I did um, find the comments that um, when you say 911 is called to respond to a scene and we have uh, a resident suffering a stroke that um, sending the fire department, um, I don't think that I would agree that that's not an efficient use of our resources and um, there could be some form of cost containment somewhere with that, especially if the fire department is responding and maybe it's just included with the contract or if that is an additional cost, um, I'm un unsure of that. And um, that's kind of uh, one of the issues that I was, um, I found really encouraging. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Um, I will say that um, every one of these calls throughout each year, and Chris, you can speak to this um, better than I can, but every one of the calls is evaluated based on what happened on that call and the location of that call. And it's, it's dropped into one of those buckets um, based on, on the detail associated with each call. And that's why it takes so long to gather this together. It's not just doing, uh, taking the numbers and, and running, you know, throwing them in a spreadsheet and, and running the numbers. There's a lot of preliminary work that needs to be done to make sure that each one of these, <clears throat> excuse me, each one of these calls is categorized accurately so that the final numbers are produced accurately. Um, all right, so, so we'll talk about the cost portion of it in more detail in the next meeting. Um, I would just encourage everyone um, to, you know, think about so it sounds to me, it sounds to me, let me, let's do this. It sounds to me like we're pretty, pretty uh, comfortable with the current five-year blending that that should continue. I didn't hear anything that would make me think uh, we would want to go differently there. Um, uh, if you can think about some more about the collapsing versus leaving it discreet as it is now, um, I think, uh, and, you know, individually, you obviously talk to Andy and Marty and see what you know, run different numbers if you feel like you have other questions, things like that. Um, but we want to be able to um, give some direction on that, you know, by, by the budget season. We're not, you know, we're not under the gun right now, but uh, if we can be thinking about that and, and talking to residents and seeing, seeing what, uh, what their thoughts are, um, that would be awesome. Steve, just an yeah. initial blush at the blending. My, my concern would be that by aggregating the three categories that all of a sudden now one group that so was at a relatively low rate is brought up as part of that average amongst the three. So they're significantly impacted at, mm -hmm. you know, as, as, uh, um, as part of the blending uh, uh, mathematics, basically. So, right. 
that's what I'm going to be looking out for. I don't want to see anybody get hit harder than if we kept our methodology the same and just did the five-year blending. Gotcha. Makes sense. Makes sense. And I think a lot of those numbers are in this, but yeah. um, but if if there's you know if you want to look at the analysis another way, I know Chris yeah. Chris has, <laughs> has all the numbers to to rehash them and see what the impact would be for each one of those categories. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, that's I think it's a valid way to to look at it. All right, excellent. Um, so seeing no other discussion on that item, let's move to item number thirteen: the approval of minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, is there any uh, corrections to the minutes? Any public comment or correction to the minutes? None are shown online, Mayor. Thank you, Keith. Okay, Russell, if you could please call the roll. Councilmember Albritton? Yes. Councilmember Jablonski? Yes. Councilmember Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Hartman? Yes. Mayor Brightcruz? Yes. Motion passed. And with that, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. everybody for Thanks coming. for coming Thanks, out. Folks. Yeah, really appreciate it. This fellow Chase, has he reached out to you? <laughs> From Christ Covenant? You look at something and, and you've had it for 10 years and you haven't used it, but you're not going to throw it out. But I keep saying that. I keep saying that to people a lot. you got to throw it out first. I haven't done it. I'm sorry. I just haven't done it. It's on my ass because it's a house inside, all the closets and stuff. Shit. I don't mind. All right. But it gets on to me because uh, I've been playing with the tag for a while. I'm looking at the. I don't want to get into it. Others. I haven't gotten in yet, but I went to the other one. I was like, that was like, that was like, uh, like, the butterfly, and, and, you know, all that stuff. Now, yeah. Well, yeah, the right of ways is supposed to be there. Yeah. But, but, well, yeah. But then, you know, we're, we're supposed to also supposed to have 50 foot setbacks. In front.